Dear students, in the previous class, we learned what are colloids, how are they classified, and how to prepare the colloids, and what are the methods of purifying the colloids. That was the idea. Today's class, we are going to discuss about what are the properties of colloids. I told you, after looking at the types of colloids and wherever colloids are available, you are now very much interested in knowing about each and every aspect of your life. Keenly you are watching, is this is a chemical? What is the chemistry behind such reaction? What is the chemistry behind such color? And why these uh, colloids are moving differently, behaving differently? All that you would have started analyzing. That's a good trend. In your home, you have milk. Unfortunately, vinegar is added to milk. Within few seconds time you can see, the milk is, will lose its nature and the particles of the fat molecules of milk will coagulate, join together and precipitate. This behavior looks so odd for you. And after learning a lot about chemistry, now you would have started analyzing different behaviors of chemical and the chemical reaction happening in and around you. And this particular reaction is a puzzle for you. How to identify what is happening? We have to learn about the properties of colloids. Colloidal solution, you can take milk for example, it is white in color. When you pass light through the milk carrying a glass tumbler, you can see one side of the tumbler, the reflected light when it is passing, it looks blue in color. At the same time, the emitted light or the transmitted light on the other side looks red in color. This today even you can uh, analyze with a sample of milk in your home. Why this is happening? So we are learning one by one properties. Properties of the colloids. The first property is going to talk about C. That is the color. Yes, dear boys. And if you want to prepare colloidal solution of gold, you know the shining yellowish color of gold. But when it is formed in the beginning, we form colloidal gold solution. At the first instant, it looks red in color, the whole solution. And afterwards it becomes purple, blue. Finally only it becomes a golden color. Now we should uh, analyze why this is happening. The reason they quote is uh, when the colloidal particles join little by little and reach the dimension of 1 to 200 uh, nanometer dimension, that time you can see the size particles slowly get accumulated into bigger and bigger size. So during this transformation, the colloidal particles, they scatter the light and because of that different colors are appearing. are generally colored. The size, shape and nature of the particles determine the color of a colloid. Larger particles absorb light of longer wavelength and therefore, transmit light of shorter wavelength. For example, in a gold sol, if the particles are very fine, the sol is red in color. But when the size of the particles grow, the color changes to purple, then blue, and finally golden. The color of a sol also depends upon the manner in which the observer receives the light. For example, 
in reflected light. An aqueous solution of milk appears blue, whereas it looks red in transmitted light. And the second property we have to learn about yes. What is yes? Size of the colloids. The colloids are having dimension ranging from one milli micron to one micrometer. That means the size of the particle, that is the diameter of the particle, are ranging this way. So if any of the material, if you are able to convert them into this particular size, then you can easily convert them into a colloidal dimension. The next one, we have to talk about the colloids are the heterogeneous in nature. This is a well-known fact to you because the colloids uh, are made up of two different phases. Yes, one is a dispersed phase, that is the solute part of the colloid. And other one is a dispersion medium, that is the solvent part of the colloid. And most of them, they try to become homogeneous in nature at times uh, because of uh, some external factors uh, and the addition of solvent, lyophobic and lyophilic type, uh, there are different uh, distinct layers are formed. Sometimes when the solvent amount decreases, uh, the molecules come closer and coagulate. So the next thing we have to talk about, fourth property of color is about F. What is F? Filterability. That means, uh, if you use a normal filter paper, the other day I gave you an example, if you want to separate only the sugar out of the coffee your mother prepared, it is difficult. So we have to try ultra-filtration method. If you use a normal filter paper, in the normal filter paper, the pore size may be bigger, so that even the colloidal particles may escape out. So normal filter paper, we cannot filter uh, the colloidal particles. Then the fifth characteristics we have to talk about, NS means uh, non-setting or the settling nature. Non-setting. What is the meaning? And the milk, uh, the same example we'll take. In your home, the milk remains uh, quite good in the solution form without precipitation for a very long time. And this behavior is because the colloidal particles, they don't have the behavior of coming closer very fast and uh, coagulating. That's a good advantageous thing for us. And uh, this behavior happens because of the charges in the colloids, all that will in the next session. So non-sitting nature of this uh, uh, colloids we have learned, they won't easily get precipitated. And the next one we talk about D. What is the D? We are talking about uh, diffusibility. Diffusibility. What is diffusibility? The colloidal particles uh, cannot uh, diffuse through the semi-permeable membrane very easily. Whereas you have a sugar solution and through the semi-permeable membrane, the sugar can easily pass through. But uh, colloidal particles cannot go through that. So they are less diffusing in nature. Then they talk about the concentration and the density, concentration of the particles uh, and the density. So that means uh, whenever we talk about a colloidal solution, uh, it is a combination of dispersed phase and dispersion medium. When we are uh, uh, increasing the concentration of salt particles or uh, decreasing the amount of the medium, now sometimes what happens when we are heating it, boiling it, uh, the solvent, the dispersion medium will escape out. So during the time, the stability of the colloid will get disturbed the particles of salt will come closer and become bigger and settle at the bottom.
And the next behavior we have to talk about are colligative properties. So what are colligative properties? Colligative properties we have learnt in Darren Standard. It is a behavior of the solutions. Solutions they show elevation of boiling point, depression of freezing point, and there is variation of osmotic pressure because of the addition of the solute particles. The solute particles will go and influence uh, the intermolecular forces because of that, because of that attractive forces available, the boiling point of the solution will increase. All those uh, behaviors are shown even by collateral particles. Okay? And uh, next thing we have to talk about shapes of boiling particles. And uh, we believe that the colonial particles are spherical entity till now. But sometimes uh, they are of different shapes. Blood for example you can take. And uh, in case of arsenious sulphide, AS2, S3, arsenious sulphide is a spherical molecule. It's a colloid, spherical shaped colloid. Whereas we take uh, ferric hydroxide, FeOH trice, that is looking like a plate-like uh, shaped molecule. And um, if you go for tungstic acid, W3O5, tungstic acid is like a needle shaped, rod, rod shaped molecules. So, all these uh, colloids are not spherical in nature. Their shape also differs. The one on the right has some milk in it. We turn out the lights and use a laser to shine through the beakers. The beaker with the milk scatters the light. The beaker with the water does not. Same experiment, this time with a green laser. You find pretty much the same results. The particles within the colloid, that is the milk, scatters the light whereas the light goes straight through the water. We have to talk about optical property of the colloids. It's a very interesting area. The, from dawn to dusk we talk about this. Yes. When you look at the sky early in the morning, during the daytime, and uh, uh, towards the later part of the day, in the evenings, and the sky looks different, different colors. And if you ask uh, some of your friends what is the color of for the sea water, immediately they come out with the answer blue in color. Is the water, sea water is blue in color? You can examine in your home, color, water's color is colorless. But even then, it looks blue in color. What is the reason behind? That is, the sky is blue in color. Because of sky, the sea water is also blue in color. It's a reflection of light. Now the question arises, why sky is blue in color? And why the evening sky is of different colors? Wonderful sceneries we see in the evening sky. All for all, we have the answer First, it was identified by Faraday and by a great scientist called Astindal. So, optical property, we have to talk about the Tyndall effect. So, what is Tyndall effect? When you have a true solution taken in a vessel, glass vessel, tumbler, Two solution is made up of uh, maybe sugar dissolved in water or salt dissolved in water. The solution is very clear and you try to pass the light through uh, this uh, glass tumbler carrying two solution. The light appears on the other side but you cannot see the path of the light. It will um, go just like that, pass through and go because the size of the particles are very very small. They don't disturb the passage of the light. In case 
the same light you are passing through a vessel, a glass made vessel, carrying milk. Now the milk has a little larger particles. And the same light when it is going through the and the, uh, the line or the path of the light is visible and also the light is getting scattered. In right angle if you see the light gets scattered. And this you can experience in your uh, home with the mill or else you have a torch light and then uh, you just uh, focus the torch light into your palm part of your hands. Uh, the other side of the whole area looks red in color. So this is a wonderful behavior in Tyndall effect is learned. Uh, we have to stop learning the world, scattering of life. The many of this natural phenomena is uh, working with the scattering of light. So this particular uh, um, uh, thing will not happen in a suspension. So this is a true solution. I told you the particle size is very small. And there is a suspension because with a, a clay or in water you add, yeah, the size of the particles are very, very large. They won't allow the passage of light on the other side. Suspension, it won't happen. True solution, the path of the light is not visible. Only in uh, colloidal solution, the path of the light is uh, visible and that's because of uh, scattering of light. Any other place have you experienced this Tyndall effect? Yes. When you go to a movie theater, there you can see a cone of uh, light, that is Tyndall cone, is appearing from the projector room to the screen. Because a lot of dust particles available in the theater and that will now scatter the light coming out of the projector room. So many examples we can call. So this is wonderful behavior of uh, Let's demonstrate the Tyndall effect. We'll begin by filling all three beakers with the distilled water. In the first, we'll leave just the water. In the second, we'll dissolve a spoonful of sugar. And in the other, we'll stir a few drops of milk. First, we'll shine through the beaker containing only the water. Although we cannot see the light beam as it is passing through the water, we'll be able to see it as it emerges unchanged from the other side. Now, we'll shine our laser through the second beaker containing the sugar solution. Once again, we cannot see the beam as it passes through the solution but we are able to see it as it emerges from the other side, again unchanged. Finally, we'll shine our laser through the third beaker, which has milky water. In this case, we are able to clearly see the light beam as it passes through the liquid. This appearance of a light beam passing through a liquid is the result of Tyndall effect. What is happening to the light beam? Let's take a closer look at what's in each beaker so that we'll have a better understanding. In distilled water, any particles are too small to obstruct the path of light as it passes through, meaning we won't be able to see the beam. A solution such as a sugar solution we made is a homogeneous mixture made up of only one phase. In this form, the solute, in this case the sugar, will dissolve in the solvent, in this case the water, and take on the characteristics of the solvent, meaning once again we won't be able to see the light hitting anything. A colloid, however, has two phases, the dispersed phase, which is the milk particles, and the dispersion medium, which is the water. In the colloid, light will scatter in different directions due to the dispersed particles. But in water and in true solutions, such as a sugar solution, it will pass through without being scattered. The Tyndall effect is used in identifying whether a liquid is a solution or a colloid. Dear students, next property of a colloid, we are going to talk about Kinetic property. 
So kinetic, uh, the word refers to movement. Yes, the colloidal particles are also showing kinetic behavior, movement. How? The great scientist Robert Brown, he wanted to view the colloidal particles through an ultra microscope. When he was trying to view them, he could see the colloidal molecules were not staying at one place. They were moving here and there in a zigzag, a random, ceaseless zigzag, you know, the movement of the colloidal particle from one place to other place, they can move in a zigzag manner. You can see the movement of the particle like this, zigzag manner. Randomly they were moving and in a, a chaotic manner, ceaseless manner, non-stop they were moving. First he was trying to identify the movement of pollen grains fell in water and that was uh, the behavior. Then he could identify why this behavior is shown because the solvent molecule that is dispersing medium around the colloidal particle, they go and they collide or heat over the um, colloidal particles. So because of this heating of these molecules uh, over the dispersed phase, uh, they started moving in a different uh, region. Maybe I can quote an example of uh, the elastic balls which, with which we play. Uh, maybe hundreds of elastic balls we carry in a vessel and just like that we throw from a height into a close to home. Then with the camera you view the particles or the balls moving. They show a different direction they start moving in a random motion. Such behavior is shown by the colloidal particles. So that is why they are uh, calling this called as uh, Brownian movement because of the scientist name Robert Brown they called as a Brownian movement. If you closely observe these colloidal particles, they are hit constantly by the particles of dispersion medium, makes them to move in a ceaseless, random and chaotic motion. This is called as Brownian movement. Electrical properties of colloids. The colloids, they show electrical behavior. What are the electrical properties of colloids? Till now we have, a, we have the perception that colloids are in neutral molecules. It's not so. They are not always neutral. Sometimes the colloids are positively charged. Sometimes the colloids are negatively charged too. How to identify them? There are methods available. The first method of electrical property of colloids is discussed by Helmholtz double layer. Helmholtz double layer, HDL. So what is Helmholtz double layer? You, I will explain you clearly. Imagine there is one colloid available. That colloid is having a negative charge. And it is available in the vessel as you know. I am taking particularly, I am zooming only one of the colloidal particles that is negatively charged. This particular colloidal particle, since it is negatively charged, it will preferentially absorb a layer of a positive charge over it. This is the first layer. First layer and that is called as a stern layer. Very strongly it is being formed and so it is called as fixed layer. The first layer of positive ions is a fixed layer. It won't move. And uh, because this layer is fixed layer, that layer will now attract the counter ion. That means negatively charged ions, uh, even um, this ions will start to move it towards the um, colloidal particles, the second layer. Okay? So there are possibilities of uh, 
uh, a negative colloid with a positive layer, first layer, and again other ions will start flocking towards it. That forms a uh, second layer. That uh, layer, second layer is a mobile layer. So in every colloid, there is a possibility of two layers. That's why the name they say scientist uh, found out as a Helmholtz. That's why they are saying Helmholtz double layer concept. So this will give you explanation for the properties of uh, colloids. Uh, I told you the colloids uh, are stable in nature in a diluted condition. The reason is uh, one of the colloid is having a uh, uh, maybe a positive uh, circumstance on the outer, the neighboring colloid will also will have a positive circumstances. Then both of them will have a repulsive force. They don't meet together. They want to be, uh, form a bigger colloidal particle and they'll come down at the second. Just in water, there will be a reaction at the solid-liquid interface. Both parts, the solid and the liquid part, carry different energy levels, which lead to a tension at their interface once they get into close contact. Basically, all substances intrinsically carry a negative surface charge once they are dispersed in water. This is caused by the high dielectric constant of water. Generally speaking, media with a lower dielectric constant carry an anionic surface charge. Water contains ions of dissolved salts. Attracted by the surface charge, these ions gather around the particle. A well-ordered and immovable layer covers the surface of the particle like a skin. This layer is also called the stationary layer, or stern layer. Cationic ions neutralize the anionic surface charge. However, as ions are often surrounded by water molecules, they are rather big and cannot neutralize the surface charge completely. A residual anionic charge remains. This remaining anionic charge attracts further ions from the surrounding water, so that a second layer develops around the particle. This layer is further away from the particle's surface. The attractive force of the anionic charges get weaker with the distance, and therefore this second layer is less ordered and movable. The second layer is called diffuse layer or Gui Chapman layer and is colloquially often termed cloud of counter ions. The boundary line between the stationary and the diffuse ions is a shear plane. The potential at this boundary line is called stern potential or streaming potential. If the diffuse ions are displaced from the particle they surround, a potential difference is created and can be measured. The next property we have to talk about is uh, electrophoresis. What is the electrophoresis? The electrophoresis uh, is nothing but from, otherwise it is called as a cataphoresis. The meaning of the word electrophoresis or cataphoresis is a movement of the sol or dispersed phase. Then we talk about the electrophoresis. In electrophoresis, uh, what happens? They take a new tube, U-shaped tube. Okay, we can talk about a burden tube. In that U-shaped tube, tube uh, they place uh, a colloidal solution. Maybe we can take um, a colored colloidal solution. For instance, I am going to take arsenious sulfide, AS2S3, which is a yellow colored salt, arsenious sulfide. So this particular colloidal solution is taken in the U-tube and you can see clearly the levels also on both the lengths. You can see the level. We are going to place a platinum electrode on both the sides. Both the sides will take a platinum electrode. And one side it is having a positive charge, other side it is having negative charge, so connected to an external circuit. 
the positively charged electrode we call it as anode and negatively charged electrode we call it as a cathode. This arsenium sulfide salt is yellow in color, maybe 100 volts of uh, potential difference is given. At the moment, till now, the lens are in the same level. When you give this potential difference, uh, you can see this uh, arsenium sulfide is a negative uh, charged colloid will start moving towards the anode. That means uh, the level of the liquid in the anode will start increasing from this level to this level. But the level of the liquid in the cathode will start decreasing. So right hand side there is a decrease in uh, level of liquid. Left hand side there is an increase. This clearly indicates to us that the colloidal particles have started moving and to that too the colloidal particles, the salt particles are having negatively charged. So anions will move towards the anode, thereby increasing the level of the limb in the anode side. So this is a clear indication that when salt particles are moving, we talk about electrophoresis or the cataphoresis. That clearly indicates to us uh, the charge of the colloidal particle. Some uh, may be having a doubt whether it's a negatively charged or a positively charged, then go for the method called as electrophoresis. That will give a clear indication of uh, the nature of the salt particle. Electrophoresis The colloidal particles and dispersion medium in a given system carry electrical charges equal in magnitude and opposite in sign. It is, therefore, expected that the particles and the medium migrate in opposite directions in an electric field. If experiments are arranged in such a way that only colloidal particles will migrate but not the medium, the phenomenon is referred to as an electrophoresis. Hence, the migration of electrically charged colloidal particles in one direction under the influence of an electric field is called electrophoresis. The phenomenon of electrophoresis can be demonstrated by an apparatus as shown here. The apparatus consists of an U tube filled with colloidal dispersion. Water is added slowly over the soil to form sharp boundaries between soil and water in the two arms of the tube. Two platinum electrodes are inserted in water into arms of the U-tube and are connected to a high voltage battery. When an electric field is applied, the boundary in one arm is seen to move down and in the other arm to move up. If it is observed that the boundary falls gradually on the negative electrode side and moves up on the positive electrode side, then the particles migrate towards positive electrode and they are negatively charged. If the reverse occurs, then the particles carry positive charge. If the electrophoresis is allowed to proceed until the particles reach the oppositely charged electrode, the particles are discharged and precipitate out, that is, they coagulate. I have to talk about the electro osmosis, electro osmosis. And uh, in your lower classes you would have learned what is meant by osmosis. Osmosis is nothing but there will be a semi-permeable membrane separating two solutions of varying concentrations. Since the semi-permeable membrane has pore size very very small, the diameter of the holes is very small, it can allow only the solvent molecules to pass through, it won't allow the 
bigger colloidal particles to move. How are you linking this osmosis with the electroosmosis? We are going to try the osmosis process with the presence of the electric field, that is the influence of the electricity in osmosis process. So that is what we are going to discuss. So in osmosis, we are going to have with a similar, maybe for, to have an easy understanding, we we'll take same U-shaped tube and this U-shaped tube is a Burton tube. In that tube, as we shall place the platinum electrode. And here we are going to place uh, a clay, wet clay, or a semi permeable membrane. It will allow only um, so a solvent to pass through the dispersion medium, not the solute particle, that is the colloidal particles. As usual, you connect here with the positive terminal, negative terminal, anode and cathode. And you may be asking a question, how the solvent is going to move? So, electroosmosis, we are talking about the movement of the dispersing medium. Dispersing medium means uh, solvent. Solvent might be water. Water is neutral. How come water can move? Neutral substance. Yes. So what happens, uh, since the colloidal particles uh, are uh, charged in nature, they cannot come and uh, move towards the semi permeable membrane. And, but water can move through the other side by passing through the holes. When they are uh, rubbing over this colloidal particle, the dispersion medium may acquire a charge. When you are moving from left to right or right to left, uh, they will acquire the charge. Now the solvent is uh, having positive charge. If you compare the level of the liquid before and after, cathode side the level of the liquid will increase, anode side the level of the liquid will uh, decrease. The reason is uh, solvent started moving now. That means in the presence of electric wave, the movement of uh, dispersion medium takes place. This is another way to identify what is the charge of the color. So dear students, in this uh, particular uh, session, we have learnt about what are the properties of uh, colloids. Uh, and in the last part, we have learnt about optical property. Um, that means the Tyndall effect, uh, kinetic property, Brownian moment and we learned about electro, uh, electrical property in that Helmholtz double layer electrophoresis and electroosmosis. You have to understand the students, the surface chemistry is the lesson where the probability of 3 marks and 2 marks are very high. So your concentration should be on to all the questions uh, you try to learn with the keywords and wherever necessary if it is a, a detailed answer type question, you go for drawing the diagrams too. Electroosmosis is the movement of a dispersion medium under the influence of an electrical field when the movement of colloidal particles is prevented by a suitable membrane. Under the influence of an electrical field, the colloidal particles and the dispersion medium both have a tendency to move towards the oppositely charged electrodes. But the semi-permeable membrane does not allow the passage of the colloidal particles. The dispersion medium, however, can pass through the membrane and therefore its movement takes place.